Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the opening press conference for SMM, the leading maritime trade fair. My name is Daniel Münter and I will guide you through this session today. During the next four days, we are witnessing a premiere. For the first time in its history, SMM will be fully and exclusively digital because of Corona. But one thing is unchanged, the interest of suppliers, ship owners and other players in the industry and of the journalists that have joined us today from more than 20 countries. We are prepared to make your time worthwhile. This press conference will feature a 60 minute panel discussion with international experts from the industry, followed by a Q&A session. You can post questions starting now via the Q&A box that is next to this video on the website. That is, if you're watching this live. Please send your questions together with your name, news outlet and the name of the expert you're directing it to. We are recording this live press conference so that you and those who can't participate will be able to review it on the SMM website afterwards. So now I would like to welcome today's experts for the press conference. Here with me in the studio in Hamburg is Bernd Aufderheide, President and CEO of Hamburg und Messe Congress. Thanks for having us, Bernd. My pleasure, Daniel. Connected via video are Maximilian Rotkopf, Chief Operating Officer of Harper Lloyd, Andreas Schell, Chief Executive Officer of Rolls-Royce Power System, <coughs> Kjersti Kleven, Chairwoman of Sea Europe, the Shipyards and Maritime Equipment Association, Knut Erbeck Nielsen, Chief Executive Officer of DMVGL and Maritime, and Martin Stopford, President at Clarkson Research. Welcome to you all. Before we dive into the discussion, we're delighted to share with you an opening remark by Keith Lim, Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be part of the SMM Digital Press Conference today. The COVID-19 pandemic had unprecedented impacts on our lives, in particular on the maritime sector and its seafarers, resulting in a humanitarian crisis. We continue to work with the international community, member states and industry to bring an end to crew change crisis and demonstrate that seafarers are at the core of a shipping's future, as the World Maritime Theme for 2021 emphasizes. Despite these challenges, the maritime sector continues to connect the global supply chains, keeping trade flowing. Sustainable shipping will also be at the center of the post-COVID recovery and sustainable growth far into the future. Therefore, we must seize the opportunities to ensure a sustainable future for shipping. Digitalization in maritime sector will be the key to enhance the resilience of the maritime supply chain and to support sustainable development and recovery. I am always working to ensure shipping can embrace the digital revolution while ensuring safety, boosting environmental protection and managing cyber security risks. However, the single biggest challenge we will be facing is a climate change. Now is the time to initiate shipping the energy transition to meet the ambitious decarbonization goal of IMO's greenhouse gas strategy and to ultimately phase out greenhouse gas emission from shipping. New technologies, new fuels, and innovation will be vital. Research into developing zero-carbon marine fuels is underway, with hydrogen, ammonia, or biofuels considered viable options. However, more action is needed, requiring huge investment, notably in R&D and infrastructure development. To achieve this, IMO is stepping up its efforts to act as the global promoter of R&D in zero carbon marine fuels, bringing together interested stakeholders from the public and private sectors. Maritime trade is vital to the world economy. Building a safer, greener, cleaner, and more sustainable maritime industry will require further international cooperation, targeted policy interventions, and investment today 
for a more sustainable tomorrow. We must all work together to enable a truly sustainable future. The SMM Digital provides excellent opportunity to discuss and provide ideas for the future of shipping. In this context, I wish you a very successful panel discussion today and a productive SMM week. Thank you. We just heard Kita Glim praise SMM as the unique place where the industry gathers and connects. SMM Digital is finally getting started. How does it feel, Bernd? Well, it feels good and I'm very happy that we are now finally getting started with SMM Digital as a purely digital conference format. When did you realize that SMM couldn't take place in the usual form? Well, that was quite soon with the appearance of the COVID-19 virus. First, beginning of May 2020, we made the decision with the SMM Trade Fair Advisory Board to postponement from September to February 2021 at a hybrid event at that time. But planability is not possible these days. So in autumn last year, we switched to a purely digital event. And our goal clearly always was to make SMM Digital a real highlight in the industry. A cancellation was out of the question? Definitely. Especially in times, I think, like these, uh, when the maritime industry uh, needs knowledge transfer. This is so important. So we make this available to the maritime industry with SMM Digital. So what can participants expect at SMM Digital 2021? Well, in the past few months, together with our partners, we organized an exciting conference program with top-class international speakers. SMM Digital offers two parallel streams, digital and free of charge. So overall, there are four days with about 60 hours of program, more than 160 speakers, experts from major market players, from science, from navies, international organization, to NGOs, will meet and discuss important topics from the maritime industry and give an outlook on future developments. As well known, um, all the well-known SMM conference formats are included. That is the Maritime Futures Summit, the GMAC, the Global Maritime Environmental Conference, MSND, the Maritime Security and Defense Conference, the Offshore Dialogue. They all will be broadcasted in the next four days via our SMM conference stream. In parallel, as a webinar, we have the Trade Winds Ship Owners Forum. And in addition, we offer the Maritime World an open stream where top-class sessions offer valuable insights and inspirations on selected topics. Of course, in times of uh, pandemic, this is always in view. We always have in view the current safety and hygiene measures. Mm -hmm. And how can participants interact at the digital fair? Well, first, at the conference stream, everyone has the opportunity to submit questions over the screen and the moderator will address the panelists. Second, during the entire SMM Digital, on both the conference stream and the open stream, viewers may communicate with each other using a chat feature. And third, in cooperation with the Enterprise Europe Network, we have MerryMatch at SMM to contact potential business or research partners and expand your maritime networks. The entire conference program of SMM Digital is free of charge this year. How did you come to this decision? Well, we are in challenging times, so uh, we thought as the world's leading maritime trade fair, there's a great solidarity with the industry. And uh, like this, all players can benefit from state-of-the-art solutions at SMM Digital. Originally, there was supposed to be a digital platform for the exhibitors. Why was this not possible? Well, the implementation of trade fairs in purely digital form was and is a challenge. And at our previous digital events, the Wind Energy Hamburg, we found that the digital platform for exhibitors did not meet their and not our requirements. And therefore we said at SMM Digital we will focus with full power on the top class conferences, sessions and the presentations. Thank you for these interesting insights and the outlook to SMM Digital 2021. The corona pandemic has not only changed the format of this trade fair dramatically, it has deeply affected every sector of the industry. Today, we talk about the current situation and how the maritime business will hopefully jumpstart this year. Knut, from your view as the CEO of DNVGL Maritime, how has the industry coped with the situation? Well, thank you, Daniel, for, for letting me try that question. I think first and foremost, we must say that the maritime industry uh, overall has really responded well to the challenges. Um, Going a little bit deeper, I would say that we both um, had the opportunity to show the resilience 
of the industry, the fact that we've been able to uh, continue to serve uh, the global uh, supply chains with um, commodities and all other goods uh, across all these uh, very challenging months uh, without delay and without jeopardizing the supply of necessities and medical equipment, uh, etc. So that's really been a point of resilience. And then I think we can also say that we've also detected a great vulnerability, like uh, Secretary General of the IMO mentioned just now, the seafarers and all the challenges that we've had uh, with the crew changeover and, uh, you know, allowing seafarers to be able to change uh, crews uh, on the vessel. So it's both resilience, great resilience, working from home offices, keeping the wheels turning, and also the great vulnerability that we have seen over these past months. Yeah, talking about the, the stuff that lets the trade going worldwide is the container ship business. Max, how's the situation there? Well, I think as Knud already said, and thank you, Daniel, for the question, uh, it is and was a big challenge for the container shipping industry. I think we were one of the very first to experience what the pandemic meant when it hit China beginning of last year. We had port closures and we saw a massive change of demand thereafter very quickly. And I think we in Avagloid, but also the whole industry reacted very reasonably and fast to the massive uh, drop in demand. And I think that flexibility was really key to adjust also the global supply chain. Nonetheless, there are still four topics that are really impacting us in the whole industry. And one being a massive and enormous volatility in demand. While we are seeing at present really strong demand on east-west trades, also driven by the changing consumer behavior of many people in the US, but also in Europe and all around the world. We have to remain flexible and react to that changing demand patterns. Secondly, there is a great imbalance in cargo flows, and in particularly the boxes are used for longer, so the 12 times are up. And that also causes a lot of challenges in the equipment supply, and in particularly we have seen that as an industry in Asia, and it is still not fully over. And thirdly, it was briefly mentioned port congestions. We see that, unfortunately, in the US, in Asia, in Europe, basically all across the world. This has a massive impact on our schedules, but also on the hinterland connectivity. And as has been said by the Secretary General, but also Knut, the difficulty in crew changes. We work very hard day in, day out to enable this, to ensure the health and safety of our seafarers. And we have all seen the importance of seafarers. They are key workers, they keep the global trade running and the supply chains running. And it really has to remain our priority to ensure that we can change course in order to operate our vessels safely and bring our colleagues back home. We as Hypergloid have signed as many others the Neptune Declaration and hope that is another important step in the right direction. And last not least, just maybe especially in these times, an important point, let's also ensure the safe passage of vessels in particularly in the west of Africa. Yeah, thank you for that insight. Uh, Shasti, if I'm not mistaken, Europe's shipbuilding industry had an especially challenging year. Please tell us about it. No, you're not, uh, not mistaken, I'm afraid. We, um, as, uh, we anticipate that Europe's complex shipbuilding is the most affected of all shipbuilding markets. And I think I will start by remi reminding us all that uh, shipbuilding globally was under pressure also before COVID due to the overcapacity, weak demand, flattened trade growth. And, but in that picture, European complex shipbuilding was doing relatively better than the global merchant markets. But with COVID-19, this changed. And we saw already in the first half of 2020 uh, that new orders decreased by 62% in tonnage and uh, around uh, more than 70% in value compared to 2019. And our last uh, figures and numbers, they confirm that this has continued throughout uh, the whole year. So, and of course, it's, it's to expect that ship owners delay investments also in new orders until better market conditions return. And for Europe, where crews and uh, passenger vessels are a significant part of the order book, both the general market condition, but also confidence in this market must return before we can expect new orders to be signed. 
So, um, and of course, like other businesses or, or sectors, both shipyards and equipment companies have uh, had severe ch challenges in their production. In periods, many have had to stop their productions. And of course, necessary but costly health and safety measures had has been implemented. So, uh, and then due to delays, some liquidity problems uh, has faced some company. And uh, last but not least, until this day, there has been difficulties with foreign workforce, uh, workforce not able to return to work due to border closures as similar, not, uh, not in the same extent that with, with seafarers, but also similar. So, and our sector is also has a high mobility of workforce, workforce within Europe. And uh, so finally, we have seen uh, significant layoff, layoffs taking place already in 2020. But these are even expected to increase as of this year and onwards. And um, we all know that uh, redundancies negatively impact uh, the sector's know-how and skills. And that at a time where we are really looking for new talent and is investing in, in new skills, which we need to cope with the with the green and digital transition in front of us. So uh, what was stated uh, four years ago that the next 10 years would uh, determine whether Europe would keep its uh, strong maritime technology sector. We are soon halfway into this period and, and this pandemic wasn't what we what we needed just right right now. Okay, that is definitely mixed news. Um, Martin, you have the broader perspective on the industry. Could you give us a quick overview? Yes, thank you, thank you, Mood. And um, uh, it's interesting to be talking after you know hearing people who are on the sharp end of the business. So I'm going to try and do the big picture in just a few minutes. Um, I think, first of all, the pandemic, if you look globally, actually, it is very unbalanced. About so far, according to the, uh, the health authority, 80% of the deaths have been in um, America and uh, Europe, and only 20% in Asia. So it's predominantly an Atlantic occurrence. The same thing is, is reflected in the world industrial figures, which um, show that China's now growing at 7% per annum, which is, for their history, recent history, quite very good. Um, Asia has sort of is rising up and is just a little below zero. The rest of Asia, excluding China, is minus 0.3%, 3 nearly zero. And the OECD countries are minus 4%. And they're coming back, but it, they're a, a long way behind at the moment. So we're starting out from this rather unbalanced global situation, uh, which fits in very well with the sorts of things that Max has been talking about for the container business. Um, if you look at the shipping industry as a whole, the Clarksy Index, which is an average of tankers, bulk carriers, container ships and gas, um, averaged last year $14,500 a day, which actually is almost exactly on the 30-year average of uh, $15,000 a day. So last year was not a crisis year for the shipping cash flows. Um, it, it, and this, of course, was due in a large part, I think, to a lot of um, the, the volatility which crept into the market. And in shipping, that tends often to be positive, again, for the reasons that has been mentioned already. Um, the shipyards uh, are facing a big order book gap, as, as Kirsty's mentioned. Uh, this year, the world shipyards will deliver about 80 million dead weight of ships. But next year, based on what they've got today, and it's getting late to take orders for next year, it'll be down to 55. And so they are very, uh, very anxious to, to, to pull in orders. And um, the, the hierarchy of, of international shipbuilding is still uh, China number one with about 11 million CGT. Uh, South Korea, close behind with 9 million CGT and Japan at about six. And so these are still the three major players in tonnage terms, though, of course, uh, since since I guess is here, I, I have to say that um, in value, uh, Europe's about 20 percent, thanks to the very high value of the European order book. Um, 
Against this background, you would have expected prices to fall, but they haven't. Uh, new building prices fell by only 4% last year, uh, which is pretty robust, and new building prices slipped back by 3%. So we're not getting the sort of collapse of prices we saw in the 80s when they literally went down by 30 or 40% uh, in, in a couple of years. Um, I think one of the reasons for this is that... Um, Investors are not so worried about the price. I mean, cash is cheap at the moment. They're worried about how to order a ship that won't be obsolete in 10 years. And this, this is a very major problem because it's forcing um, ship owners to make uh, technical decisions that they're not really that well equipped to, to make. And I don't mean that in any way as a criticism of the individuals, but a typical shipping company doesn't have a big technical department nowadays uh, you're lucky if you've got a if you've got one technical director and so i think this prospect as as, as uh, mr lynn said we're coming up to a period of enormous technical change but we are have been set up as a business which is really focusing on keeping the cost as low as possible and that often doesn't run to the sort of technical depth that you need to tackle some of the issues that are on the table today. And so I, I would say, looking at the industry as a whole, there is masses of demand. Shipbuilding is potentially a growth industry, but we need digitally ergonomic designs. By that, I mean we need to ensure that the ships have the I tef, I4 technology that will enable them to achieve the sort of goals, both in the performance area uh, and logistics and the carbon saving and climate change area that Mr. Lynn uh, referred to. And that, I think, actually is, is where I'd like to leave it now. Great opportunity, difficult time, but um, a time I think that's going to be very, very interesting and challenging for the industry. Thanks. Back to you, Daniel. Excellent. Thanks for this perspective. And we're going to talk about greener shipping a lot more later on. Um, but let's first uh, round up this first round by asking Andreas. Uh, Andreas, Rolls-Royce Power Systems serves the maritime, defense, the yacht sector, governmental and commercial marine. Apparently with this mix, you have managed to do quite well in 2020. But how did you have to adapt your business processes to cope with this situation? Thanks, Daniel. Before I get into that, uh, let me first um, thank for the invitation to join this distinguished panel. And let me also say um, there's really very little we can really do about the COVID pandemic that hit all of us so hard. But I think we can change our approach, how we cope with that. And therefore, I'm really excited and happy that the SMM takes place, even if it is a digital format and uh, we at Rolls-Royce Power Systems are really excited to join. How is the business doing? Um, our, our naval business, as expected, um, turned out to be extremely stable. The governmental business, due to um, really difficulties in, in commercial negotiations and getting contracts set up, um, is a bit behind or was a bit behind in 2020, a bit more challenging. The commercial marine is kind of a mixed bag. Um, the yachting industry turned out to be surprisingly good, and some of it because of the advertisement campaigns around have your own private island, which turned out to be very successful. Other parts of commercial marine, not so good. Um, ferry businesses and some of these segments went down by about 75%. One thing that really kind of, to my surprise, or maybe not to my surprise, really kind of um, became a lasting scheme during the year 2020 was sustainability. Not only kind of did it um, increase in intensify, in, and intensify, but it's very clear that sustainability is here to stay and it will accelerate for all of us. Now, we as a company had to also rethink and relook our approach, how we basically approach and go after the market. I was, I'm very happy that we never missed one single delivery in 2020, despite challenges in the supply chain, having to manage the, su the supply chain, um, also making sure that our um, shop floor workers really were able to work um, under distance requirements and under special measures. 
but we're very proud we never miss a shipment to any one of our customers. Well, what about sales? I think the picture for the people in our sales organization has massively changed. We had to kind of switch over to more digital formats, kind of getting connected with customers where we used to kind of have real physical visits. Uh, we now have to kind of use video conferences. Other examples for where we had to work digitally, uh, effect, take a look at the factory acceptance test, for instance, that now had to take place remotely. But I would say that um, the people, both on our customer side, but also inside our company, really took a very proactive uh, approach on that. Um, as I said, factory acceptance test, certification test, witnessing, all of these things all of a sudden were possible to kind of be done remote. Um, service, similar situation there. Um, I was very happy when I got reported that we were even doing a remote commissioning um, of a commercial vessel under these circumstances and that we had our engineers connected by video conference to a few people at our customer site locally and we were able to kind of set up a ferry, for instance, the Duxon ferry where we put in an LNG gas engine on the vessel. A lot of change. I'm very proud of what my team together with our customers was able to accomplish. Um, I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure and certain that, that some of these things will stay with us. So for instance, we are going to kind of uh, continue to use webinars going forward. And we will also set up a, an internal trade show, which will be completely digital this year. And uh, I think some of these concepts um, will stay with us, even though I would like to be in Hamburg today in person. Yes, thank you. Knut, um, talking about digital transformation and new services, uh, compared to some others, DNVGL has had a head start when it comes to digital services. How did that play out? Yes, it's it's true. Actually, we've spent uh, the the past five years really on on you know modernizing our service delivery and and taking a lot of digital uh, services uh, as as a way of doing that. Uh, so maybe like Andreas was mentioning, the the way that we have really been able to continue to serve our customers with remote surveys. You know, having a situation where of uh, surveyors cannot travel to the ports, they cannot uh, visit shipyards and manufacturers uh, in all locations, and then naturally to have the capability to do remote surveys has been very instrumental during these uh, months uh, that we've just been through uh, in the pandemic. And the fact that we started this already back in 2018 gave us a, a really good start, and we were able to have... Uh, um, a lot of experience and knowledge how to do this. And now uh, we have conducted more than 20,000 uh, remote surveys and uh, it is really working uh, very well. And I must say that we are truly happy that we're able to continue to serve our customers in all locations, either physically on board with our surveyors or uh, through the remote surveys. And Daniel, if I can mention one more thing, which is uh, quite important uh, in the pandemic, and that is uh, the way that we launched a new service, and that was uh, really targeting uh, the cruise line operators and, you know, letting them be able to better control and mitigate the risk of infection and infection spreading. So we were actually able to bring together a lot of the medical expertise that we have in the company. I mean, you wouldn't probably believe it, but we are certifying hospitals around the world and in particularly in the US uh, for a, a you know, infection control and prevention. And to bring these uh, experts together with the maritime expertise, we were able to launch a very good and capable program for, for the crews and the passenger uh, segments to be able to control the, the infection risk. And uh, naturally, that has been a very significant uptake during the pandemic and, and one of the necessities in order to get back into safe uh, sailing. So those are two examples that I, I, I think I can highlight in this uh, uh, context. Thanks. Yeah, it's amazing. Th those are things that we, we didn't think about like one year ago. and. Uh, I would like to take you back on a, on a time travel back to the beginning of 2020 
Back then, the sulfur cup seemed to be the, one of the largest concerns of the industry. Um, how was the pre-pandemic start to this regulation, Max? Daniel, thanks for reminding us indeed. I think with all the COVID talk and uh, problems and challenges we had, this was almost forgotten. I think changing all our vessels as everyone else to a new type of fuel, most of all ensuring they all will be compliant on time on day one, January 1, and in particularly beforehand are provided with low sulfur fuel oil for their voyages was a huge challenge. Um, a challenge that has been prepared for a very long time, at least here at Hapagloid, where colleagues from all across the company, from global fuel procurement, uh, the fleet management, and many others have been involved. It worked out very well for us. We have been compliant on the very first hour of the regulation. And that, of course, was an achievement. It was a big effort and one that indeed has almost been forgotten. Um, and I'm very grateful for you to remind us of the efforts that have been taken by the industry, but also all the colleagues. Um, overall, we do very welcome this regulation. It's another important step to ensure low emissions. And it is also key that we created a level playing field here for all the participants and uh, players in the industry. That's what we need if we want to have a better ecological footprint. And Secretary General outlined it, there is more to come. And the whole marine industry and the maritime industry will have to embark on that journey. Martin, if, if I remember correctly beforehand, there was uh, some concern about availability and price of low sulfur fuels. You had a look at the financial impact on the freight rates. Uh, please tell us about it. Yes, thanks, Daniel. I, I think probably you could have um, run a fleet of zero carbon VLCCs on the hot air we generated talking about whether you should fit a scrubber, but it didn't really turn out to be that big an issue. In fact, um, so far, we've got about 3,800 ships on our, um, order, on our fleet list, which have got scrubbers fitted. And that's out of 100,000 ships. So it's only about 3.5%, uh, which is not a very significant amount. Most people went for the, um, the, the, the low sulfur fuel uh, oil. Um, the figures for that are quite interesting. In fact, after starting out with quite a big differential between the very low sulfur fuel oil and the um, conventional um, uh, uh, heavy fuel oil, um, it, it narrowed quite rapidly. And by um, the middle of the year, there were, we were running a position where there was about a margin of 80 to to $100 a tonne um, as the differential. So that was the difference that you saved if you got scrubbers on uh, or you paid extra for fuel if you didn't have scrubbers. If you factor that into um, an earnings per day calculation, um, in the last six months, uh, it comes to, for, for a Panamax bulker, um, the differential uh, is about a thousand, a little under $800 a day. It, it was, um, uh, the average uh, was 14,100 per day if you got scrubbers fitted, and it was about 13,200 per day um, if you didn't. So you, that, you were losing about 800 dollars a day, which is not a great deal in a year. If you multiply that by trading days in a year, um, it's, you know, it's three or four hundred thousand dollars, which um, is not all that much considering, it depends how much you paid for the scrubbers, of course, but it was probably several million dollars. Um, the, the big issue in here, though, um, which I'm sure Max would be very aware of, is the fact that the, the economics change completely if you're running a container ship. I mean, there's container ships being delivered recently, which are designed for 23 knots with 240 tons a day of fuel. And if you um, actually fit scrubbers onto those ships at today's prices, you're saving fifteen, twenty thousand dollars um, $20,000. So it's a lot of money, potentially. So I think... Um, you know, most people didn't. Uh, perhaps the most important thing is that it's been a, a bit of a case study about worrying about the right thing. You know, I think we have to get better at focusing on what is really going to happen. And in this case, it turned out to be 
a, a little bit of a non-event if you regarded the event as fits fitting a scrubber. Uh, of course, we still got to change fuel, <laughs> but still. Anyway, that, 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 that's where we got to, uh, Daniel. Yes, thank you, uh, Kirsty. As we just uh, heard from Martin, uh, besides low sulfur liquids, there were also the alternatives on the table or on the ships like LNG and also scrubbers. Did you see these options equally embraced? Well, generally, when I'm representing Sea Europe, we don't favor one technology before another, but we are very much in favor of innovation. So, um, uh, and I know the maritime technology industry to be very innovative and, and eager to develop these new solutions needed. And, and of course, our member companies have developed both scrubbers, LNG engines, and are, they are now looking into different new types of fuels for the future. So our main point is that there is a legal certainty and predictability, uh, because only then the industry will be able and willing to make the ne necessary investments uh, in, in these kinds of innovation. And that goes also for ship owners, shipyards, and su suppliers. And we should encourage the, the early movers. So um, I'm not uh, having a, uh, in the case of scrubbers, perhaps uh, it shows that policymakers should be careful to embrace and support one specific technology in favor of others. But, uh, and what we need from policymakers is to, that they set the targets, or in this case, perhaps the limits of, of emissions and give incentives to those technologies which actually meet the, these limits. So. Uh, and then the industry itself has the task of coming up with the, the different solutions in in a dynamic interaction with, with the market. So uh, so technology neutrality is is important for us. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Knut. Uh, from your view, how has especially the market uptake of LNG evolved in 2020? Well, 2020 was quite a remarkable year uh, when it comes to gas as fuel and LNG in particular. And um, uh, if we go a few years um, prior to that, it was predominantly in the short sea segment that we saw gas as, uh, as fuel. Uh, however, 2020 really kicked off uh, with gas as fuel also for the deep sea segments like container, like Max is representing, uh, but also for the, the bigger um, uh, tankers. Uh, and um, uh, if you look to the order book now, and uh, you could see that around 30% of what is on order now is uh, with gas as fuel. Uh, and that is quite a significant step up. And I think it underlines uh, some of the challenges highlighted uh, by Martin earlier that it is uh, quite a challenging choice for many ship owners these days to land on uh, which type of fuel and, and propulsion option is the best and, and which will last for, for the next couple of decades. But I think it's fair to say that gas as fuel has really uh, proven to be very robust in the studies that we have done. Uh, it is one of the most robust alternatives. It is practical, uh, practically proven. It is available. It comes at, an, uh, at a relatively good price point. Point. So I think uh, like Hapag Lloyd and, uh, and Max have done, they, they chosen to go for dual fuel gas engines and, and that has really kicked off uh, during last year and, and I'm sure it will continue to accelerate during this uh, decade. Thank you. Yeah, talking about LNG brings us seamlessly to the next big topic, uh, the challenges around the Sulfur Cap 2020 and even the Corona crisis are as pressing as they are, small against the goals of the IMO greenhouse gas strategy to reduce emissions by at least 50% by 2050. Uh, what progress has there been since the strategy was adopted in April 2018? Andreas? Well, as I said at the beginning, sustainability is the name of the game and uh, it's here to stay and we've seen this. We're now seeing countries, but also customers who really kind of are very clear on their objectives and they set very ambitious targets. For instance, to be um, completely climate neutral 
um, by the year 2050. And I also see that the whole industry is working and preparing to achieve this. So we are also, as one of the players in the propulsion part of the industry, are intensively preparing for this. One example is the introduction of our of LNG technology. Um, we've done this very successfully for ferries in the Netherlands, here on Lake Constance, but also in Singapore and Asia, and we continue to sell that product. But it's very clear it won't and it doesn't stop there. This will penetrate, this will reach much further. So we are preparing for the use of alternative fuels, um, of e-fuels. We're looking into the production, but also into the use of carbon dioxide neutral fuels. And last but not least, this reaches all that far that we need to kind of invent, develop completely new propulsion concepts, such as fuel cells, um, such as hybrid systems for select um, areas of the mar maritime business for us. And we are not doing this in isolation. I see customers really proactively now asking for that. And as I said, this has clearly intensified during the year 2020. Uh, of course, the expectations are very high. Don't penetrate um, the utilization of, uh, of the vessel in, in itself. So this all only will work in conjunction across the entire industry. We need to find solutions all together. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Max, how about Habak Lloyd? How did you deal with this topic so far? Well, I think as Knut mentioned, this is high on our agenda. Um, I think more generally, we are very fond of implementing regulations for more sustainability of the industry. Again, if this is on a level playing field for everyone. And I do believe that the entire maritime industry needs to further work closely together to develop cleaner technologies in order to support that change and that high ambition goal. APAC, we have a long tradition in sustainability and uh, going further, we put a lot more emphasis on gas propulsion. I would mention that is definitely a lot of uh, developments that took place and uh, we believe this is one of the ways forward to meet the IMO 2030 goals, but also beyond. As such, we are at this very moment uh, retrofitting the very first ultra-large container ship to gas propulsion. and. Moreover, we have, as many of you might have seen towards the end of the last year, ordered six LNG dual fueled vessels. And uh, we do believe that gas propulsion is an important element in our um, propulsion mix and in our portfolio going forward. And therefore, this will play a more important role in the next years, especially on the large vessels. Yeah, so not surprising, climate change and green shipping are big topics within the maritime industry. Uh, how is this reflected at SMM Digital, Bernd? Well, in general, SMM Digital reflects all the big themes of the maritime industry, and therefore it's uh, quite obvious that um, green shipping also plays a major role at SMM Digital. Obviously, these are key topics at the GMAC and the Maritime Future Summit, but they can also be found uh, all across uh, the conferences. And of course, another big thing is the digitalization. Yes, thank you, Bernd. Uh, in the middle of the pandemic, there was something else coming into the game. It's the EU Green Deal. Uh, how will it accelerate the decarbonization of the maritime industry, Kjersti? Well, I, uh, I started out a bit pessimistic, perhaps, about the current situation of, of our sector, but the Green Deal from the European Commission is one of the things that make me optimistic for the, for the future of our industry, together with what is mentioned here as uh, the possibilities of digitalization, and I also would add the future growth of, of the blue economy. And I think the, the greening of shipping is an opportunity for the European maritime technology sector. I think our sector, with its uh, high technolo technological competence and performance, is in a good position to use the Green Deal as a tool to maintain a leading maritime region. So given that the tools are right tools are used, and, and see Europe has also given inputs on this, and we are suggesting to adopt the EU-wide fleet renewal scheme in accordance with the, with the aims of, uh, of the Green Deal and the IMO targets. 
and we think that there are techn- technologies ready to be implemented in the in the short term. And of course, then we have to stimulate uh, RDI, and we hope to have the, the co co program partnership for zero emission waterborne transport accepted uh, this spring and. That's that's a program certainly for the cooperation throughout the, the whole sector. And we would welcome the adoption of a dedicated maritime fund also to, to support the, the investments the needed. And then I think uh, when we are talking about greening, the whole value chain will, will be evaluated eventually, not only the vessel and its performance. So... And when it comes to manufacturing, our sector is, is also in a digital transformation of its yards and its factories. That, uh, and this transformation goes hand in hand with the green transformation. So, And of course, if we allow ourselves to look a little even further into the crystal ball, the vision of having clean steel from European mills would boost the advantage of, of uh, European production when it comes to carbon footprint of a vessel. And I have already mentioned the legal frameworks for uh, for innovation and and research. So, uh, but last, I will also uh, mention that it's of utmost importance to ensure that our workers can be leading in the in this twin on digital and green transition. So, uh, so we also have to invest in skills. And in this regard, the EU has launched a very interesting uh, initiative, which they call the EU Pact of Skills. So. Uh, my conclusion is that uh, I think the combination of, uh, of green technology, digitalization, and the few, few further gro- growth of the blue economy, that is actually kind of the foundation of, of, for the future of our sector. That's a very positive outlook. Uh, but one thing uh, kind of is in my mind, the targets set by the Green Deal seem to be more ambitious than IMOs. Um, what is your opinion on this, Knut? Is this good or bad? Um, yes. Um, I, first of all, I would like to say that I, I think Kjersti has uh, put forward some very good uh, points, um, like um, the need for innovation, the need for research, Uh, the need for collaboration amongst the various industry players. So I I think these are all, say, elements that are positively driven by the ambitions put forward, in this case, by the EU or indeed by other nations. We also, uh, say, just end of last year, heard similar uh, ambitions from the likes of China, Japan and South Korea. Uh, So what concerns me is the fact that... um, shipping being an international business it is really you know quite dangerous i would say when we get you know a regional patchwork of regulations and um, and with the eu green deal and uh, the emission trading system in particular when this is regionalized it doesn't really support the nature of international shipping uh, i respect and i applaud the ambitions of the eu and and similar nations put forward and indeed decarbonization is the grand challenge of over time but i think the vehicle really has to be with the imo it has to be the imo timeline that is the one that we all try to uh, deliver on Uh, whether that timeline is ambitious enough i think is something that the imo will need to deal with Um, and then uh, to have the imo enforce uh, regulations and requirements that all players uh, have to deal with internationally. I think that is uh, ultimately important. And I can only wish that the EU and others would, um, you know, support the uh, ambitions and the drive in the IMO and advance it if necessary, but at least do it through the IMO. And uh, if we manage to do that, I think we are on a really good uh, 
pathway. I think we will continue to have a level playing field for all international companies. And also, I would like to say that the ICS proposal to uh, put uh, a modest carbon tax uh, where the money is put into a research fund to further enhance the alternative fuels and energy efficiency in the shipping sector makes a lot of sense and something that I would really support. So my conclusion is, yes, the ambitions are good with the EU, but let's really work it through the IMO. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> thank, thank you for that insight. Yes, uh, as you just mentioned in your answer, is uh, one of the important things uh, the industry is talking about is alternative fuels. Uh, Andreas, uh, how important is the interconnection of sectors for the success of the energy transition from your view? I truly believe that um, alternative fuels, that's one of the, the most important and the biggest lever for the success of the maritime energy and transition. And in the center of that are so-called e-fuels. You can call them synthetic fuels, e-fuels, whatever you name them. They all have some one thing in common. They require electricity to produce them. And this auto automatically, after thinking through this, brings us to sector coupling. Energy transition in shipping and energy supply are therefore closely interwoven, closely connected. And therefore, sector coupling, which basically is interlinking electricity, energy, heat, and mobility, and the optimal use of globally available renewable energies, they are quintessential for the success of the energy transition in the maritime industry. I'm personally very convinced that power to x offers the most promising approach and um, for converting globally available regenerative energy uh, basically into e-fuels. And therefore, it's something that, especially at Rolls-Royce Power Systems, where we are in the business of propulsion and energy supply, we really need to understand, we need to own, and we need to develop and bring this technology to fruition. There is no alternative from my, my viewpoint on doing this. The good thing is, the analysis really shows that there is a great demand for e-fuels. Now, they happen to be very costly today, and therefore I think increasing demand will really kind of help to bring the cost down. And we know that these quantities can be produced, but again, um, connecting different sectors will really be helpful, and therefore sector coupling is an essential success factor for that. We are working in several projects, and they are very promising. One of them is a project called MathQuest, founded by the German Department for Eco of Economics. And within that project, we have, we, have, we have the lead for that project. And one par partial aspect of that project really deals with the development and the production of, re of um, e synthetic e-fuels, basically for the maritime industry. Now, we need to be very clear, while this will definitely support the energy transition in the maritime industry, this will also regard, regard many, many other industries. It's a common opportunity and a common challenge in front of us. Definitely. E-fuels are a big topic for not only the maritime industry, as you're saying, but for you know many other sectors in society too. And it's a big thing to start this uh, transition. Uh, the, the first steps are, that are taken right now on the international level, they're, they're, they're somewhat different. Um, Martin, uh, IMO's Maritime Environment Protection Committee uh, approved draft amendments for greener shipping, including a carbon intensity indicator uh, with, rate, with a rating scheme. Uh, is this a good first step and, and where does it lead? And is it fast enough? Uh, well, thanks, Daniel. I, I right behind this one. I think um, you know, picking up on Kirsty's point about the need to nail down the right focus for our technology, I think that's really important. And um, Nut also said we've got to do this at a global level. And I, I think that the, the great risk in the whole of this technical challenge that we face is that we actually get buried in detail. And so what, what, the way I try to think about it myself is to divide the work that lies ahead of us into a series of waves. And 
the first wave of technology is uh, involves the 100,000 ships on the sea today, which are going to be around for a while. And we have to, if you like, inoculate them against emissions. We have to do what we can for those ships to make sure that they, because they're the ones, the first focus. The second wave, which is probably concurrent with that, is that we're going to be building uh, new diesel ships or dual fuel ships for quite a few years to come as we start to develop because you know we're working across many different market segments. The third wave is when we start to come in with the gas and hybrid ships, which are actually showing uh, substantial savings through the fuel that they're using and um, bringing battery technology into the game, which we need both of those because it gets the industry into cryogenics for fuel. It gets the industry into rebuilding the whole electrical platform of the ship, which we're going to need probably for stage four is when we go to the all electric zero carbon ships. I mean, it may be something else, but that's a little way off anyway. Um, I think Andreas mentioned the, the, the fuel cells. Uh, but solar is looking very, very good now. So I think the, the chances that we're going to get cheap um, uh, fuel from uh, uh, readily available looks much better to me today than it did a year ago when we were meeting previously. Um, the focus today, I think, really does need to be on wave zero. We've got to, the shipbuilding industry can't replace 100 million tonnes of ships overnight. Uh, overnight you know it's going to take years to do that so we have to deal with them and this is very important for smm customers because of course it involves retrofitting and getting many of the different pieces of equipment uh, especially the digital um, equipment and to come back to your question daniel i'm sorry i've i've, I've gone away from it a little bit but the the, the, the IMO's carbon intensity indicator and the energy efficiency existing ship index, it seems to me, are the sort of thing that you really need to do in order to make sure that we do deal with the existing fleet effectively. I know it's going to be very difficult. I know to begin with, the bar has not been set very high. Very high. There are many people who've um, criticised it for that. But really, you have to, it's a massive job, as Mr Lim says, and you've got to start somewhere. And I think that uh, where the um, MEPC started is uh, as good as anything I can think of. So um, the answer is yes, I think it's a good job. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of technological uh, development necessary and a lot of crucial investment decisions to be made in the future. Uh, Max, uh, going on this journey, the sector will have to deal with persisting uncertainties. What do you expect for the near future? Daniel, I don't have a crystal ball and I think the last year has shown how much and how fast the world can change, how rapidly this completely disrupts everything you had planned for. And uh, it also showed that you have to be flexible, you have to be agile and reacting and uh, I definitely do expect that this year will still see a lot of uncertainty. I also do expect that the next couple of weeks and probably months, we still, at least in the container sector, see a lot of operational disruptions while ports and also the hinterland uh, structures and, of course, also us working through the backlog and working through the high demand. Beyond that, I do see a renewed challenge on innovation. Um, I think it has been mentioned by many of the panelists already. And I do also expect an even stronger focus on digitization. It also showed last year how important it is to digitize your customer interface, but also many of the processes internally. And that I do expect will continue with a lot of speed and, and focus also into this year. Beyond that, uh, I remain optimistic, but I also do remain alert to whatever might come there. We are not yet through the pandemic and uh, a lot will depend now on the speed, but also success of the global vaccination programs, obviously. Thank you. Kirsty, when the COVID haze clears, how quickly is business going to recover? Well, I'm a bit back where I, where I started because our analysis have predicted that the full impact of, of this uh, pandemic uh, on, on our 
on our maritime technology sector will hit hardest as of this or next year and onwards when the orders for new ships will have dried up. So, and due to the, the long lead times in shipbuilding, this situation is not expected to, to change before uh, another two, three years, speaking about to 23, 24 at least. So therefore we are searching and discussing measures to meet the, this critical period that we are in. So, and, um, and so far measures taken from, from policymakers at all levels, internationally or, or nationally, are mainly designed to mitigate the immediate consequences of COVID. And uh, of course we have also immediate effects, but, uh, but the biggest challenges are in front of us. So. Um, but uh, as we know, actually see some new renewed political concern for our sector. We hope that um, proposals put forward by our organization and others will be listened to. And uh, as I mentioned, one of these proposals are uh, is include a fleet renewal scheme aiming at assisting the sector to overcome the, this uh, forecasted slumps in the in this uh, coming three years. And this also, and this is also perhaps what what Martin Stopford is talking about. We need to start this uh, this retrofitting, and and we have the technology also needed to, to some of the technology needed to do this. So, and we need this also to to pave the way for for foundation the foundation I mentioned earlier, the the digital innovation, the green ships of the future, and also the growth of the the blue economy. So, and of course, we are also always working hard to improve the general framework conditions as we also did before COVID-19. So to meet uh, the tough international uh, uh, global uh, competition. So I am perhaps, I have perhaps been painting a dramatic picture of our industry, but uh, as also the other panelists say, are saying here, we are not uh, definitely not giving up and our sector is uh, known to be uh, be made up of people with endurance. So uh, we know that our technology and technology is vital for Europe as a world leading maritime region. And uh, I am uh, optimistic that uh, policymakers are seeing the same strategic picture. Thank you. Thank you for this dramatic but honest uh, assessment of the situation. Um, Knut, maybe I can ask you for an uh, outlook a little further ahead and maybe a little more upbeat even. <laughs> uh, yes, it's uh, it's good to follow Shasta because I think she has uh, very good points uh, that she brings uh, forward and, and her focus on, you know, the people in this industry and their uh, ability to really take on challenges. Um, it is really awesome and, uh, and that is where I also see, you know, if you look a little bit into uh, this as a decade, I think it is really a, a time for the maritime industry where we will have, we have at our hand a, a grand challenge and it is now really uh, to step up to this challenge for all the individuals engaged in this industry um, and I'm really very optimistic. I think that we have an opportunity to bring back what I call a maritime renaissance, where we are really challenging, you know, the status quo, uh, the way we have done things for many years. Uh, we bring in innovative ideas, we, we collaborate, uh, we bring a closer connection with, you know, partners, maybe also from outside the industry to bring in new insights. And I think this is really, you know, fueling a lot of new ideas. And uh, I'm, I feel very confident that um, after the haze of the pandemic, as you, as you put it, has cleared, we will really enter a fantastic period with the maritime renaissance, a lot of new ideas, and where we will be able to again uh, put the maritime industry where it really belongs, and that is at the core of economic uh, progress and development. So yes, I am optimistic. I think we have a, a really good decade ahead of us. Thank you for this very positive outlook on the next decade. Uh, I would like to thank our speakers for now. Now it's time for the questions we've received from the audience. Uh, the first one goes to Hirsti. Uh, the question comes from Safir Kakus from IAA Port News. 
And the question is, Russia is interested in local production of shipboard equipment. Do you see any prospect for Sea Europe companies to establish local manufacturers or of marine components in Russia? I must leave that, that question to the, to the actual companies. I don't think it's the, it's the role of, of Sea Europe to, uh, uh, to facilitate uh, this. Uh, but of course, as uh, our in industry is global, so uh, and uh, and uh, of course we know there already are uh, um, uh, corporations uh, uh, across both Europe and also uh, to uh, to Russia on on technology, but um, I think uh, that has to be left to the to the uh, single company to start. Thank you. The next question goes to Martin. It's from uh, Paul Bartlett uh, from Sea Trade. I'm always still shipping's main regulatory organization, but is under threat from regional moves. We just talked about the EU uh, Green Deal early on, uh, notably in Europe. Uh, it is blamed for being too slow. How can this issue be tackled to ensure that regulations continue to be to run globally? Uh, well, that's um, that's a great question, and um, I'm just trying to get my mind around it. Actually, uh, I, I think that um, uh, the the challenge. You know, we're all talking an awful lot about zero carbon, and I think I'd say in the last year, the one thing that's really happened is that the industry has intellectually bought into zero carbon. But if we're going to do that, it's going to cost four billion dollars, and it's it's a regulatory issue. Three or four, sorry, three or four trillion dollars. That's what's what we're, that's the investment that we need. And um, the challenge for the industry is how you actually focus on this. It's the point that um, that's come up quite a few times. How do you manage this? And I really think part of the job is for uh, IMO to put the regulations in place, uh, the framework of re regulations. They understandably take a long time to put those regulations to work. It's a very big organization. You need to get 170 countries to, to, to sign up to um, the, 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 the conventions and, or the amendments to the conventions. And so I, I think that a big part of this responsibility needs to be picked up by the other truly international part of the industry, and that's the shipping companies themselves. That one of the great things about the digital revolution is that it's going to enable shipping companies to work real time uh, across the world in the way that we're doing now um, within their companies. It's, it's going to make it possible to set up um, plans and programs. We're going to start for the first time ever to know what the, the ships are doing and to monitor performance. And hopefully we will be able to share that information. But my biggest worry actually, Paul, is not the IMO, I think the IMO will do its best. I think the biggest problem is that um, the equipment industry and the shipbuilders are hugging the information to themselves so much that they won't share it. And therefore we can't actually move down the road. And that's where we come to the point where I think Newt made this point, Kirsty made it. The industry does in some ways need to work together. It's what McKinsey recommends for I4. It's one of the key things that McKinsey says to a company that's moving on land, that's moving into I4, you need to get the different parts of the business, of, of the industry talking to each other in key areas. And I think that would be just as important as what the regulators do. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Sorry, Rob, Rob. No, no, excellent, <laughs> excellent answer. Uh, uh, Knut, do you maybe want to uh, comment on that too? Yeah, I think Martin um, put forward lots of good points here. Maybe one thing that we also see uh, developing and, and that could sort of, now we put a lot of focus on the regulators, but it's actually the market forces as well that is having a major impact on the speed in which this will move uh, going forward. And we've seen the creation of the Poseidon principles, the sea cargo charter. And um, in the decade we're entering, when we are talking about 
about digital, it also means that there will be much more visibility on the CO2 emissions. And uh, to have that transparency will certainly also drive uh, a, a market force for creating you know, a, a real progress on the CO2 emission reductions. So on the one hand, you have naturally the regulators, but maybe even more dominant coming forward could be, uh, say, the wider stakeholder groups like the financiers, the, the charterers, uh, and other uh, in the in the chain uh, that are really making an influence. So, um, but the political pressure is uh, increasing all over, and uh, this will continue as we have younger politicians taking up you know, parliamentary seats, whether it's in Europe or elsewhere. And uh, and the pressure is certainly on for the industry to uh, take on this grand challenge. Uh, but I'm, I'm, as I said before, I'm really confident that this is something that the industry will respond in a very good way to. Thank you. Uh, the next question goes to Andreas. It's from Julia Vinogradova from Port News Media Group. And the question is, could you please share your company's experience in autonomous shipping? When, in your opinion, can we expect large-scale introduction of unmanned ships globally? That's a great question because it is such an important question for the entire industry and like it is for other industries. And I think it will be a trend uh, that will intensify as well. Now, it will not come overnight. It will rather come in phases. And uh, we have a lot of activities going on that are in regard of autonomous um, shipping. We concentrate right now that ships are really ready for this. Uh, one example, the artificial chief engineer on a vessel. Um, another aspect is the remote service as an enabler to kind of already get into this remote activity. Another example, equipment health monitoring, and we do have a running prototype already. Um, and then when you really look at all of this, you come very quickly to the point that you need to think from bridge to propeller when it comes to autonomous shipping. And this is part of our strategy. And as part of that in December, we did make an important acquisition. We announced that we acquired ServoWatch um, which is basically a company that will allow us to kind of have the latest um, um, technology in the bridge technology available. Um, and from my viewpoint, we all need to work on these enablers before we can talk about full autonomous shipping. We are on the way. Thank you for that answer. Uh, the next question goes uh, to Max. It's from Safia Kahus again from IAA Port News. Um, the question is, please tell about your company's plans on using marine alternative fuels for your ships. We talked about this earlier and the question is, uh, what are your plans on this? Yeah, thanks, Safia. Um, indeed, uh, we look at this from a portfolio point of view um, to match 2020. We have, of course, taken the majority in compliant fuel, but we also have invested actively in scrubbers and now going forward, as I outlined before, um, gas propulsion plays an important role for us and particularly on some of the very large vessels that we just ordered, but also we are in the process of uh, refitting one of our 15,000 TU ships at the moment in Asia to gas propulsion. So that is clearly something and that also enables us going forward to as Andreas before mentioned, the importance of e-fuels will only increase in the next years. And this technology is compliant. We don't know how the future looks like, but we want to be prepared. So we look at this from a portfolio view and definitely gas will play a role. Also, when we come to e-fuels at one point, when they become available at scale and also at competitive cost, this definitely will play a role in our future mix. Thank you. Yeah, there, there's another question that goes into the same direction. It's again from uh, Julia Vinogradova from Port News Media Group, and it's uh, directed to Knut. Uh, could you please share your forecast on using alternative fuels in shipping? And uh, the list is long here. And the question, LNG, hydrogen, ammonia, electric batteries, sails and scrubbers. <laughs> 
that's still a small question to try to respond to. Um, yeah, so let, let's start on, on what I already mentioned. So gas is uh, certainly a bridging fuel. And when I say bridging, that is really quite a long bridge, but it brings us forward to something um, that is on the way to full decarbonization. And like Andreas mentioned, to bring in, you know, the e-fuels uh, later on gives a lot of flexibility. So, so gas, although not in itself the perfect solution, it certainly can be a, a really good pathway to decarbonization, and especially when you bring in the e-fuels. Then there is the question, what else? And, and certainly at this stage, I think we all should... Uh, continue to explore different opportunities. In the studies we've done, we've seen that methanol and ammonia uh, has uh, quite a bit of potential uh, and something that certainly needs to be followed up closely going forward. But there are also other alternatives and, and hydrogen, all, although maybe not suitable for the deep sea shipping segment because it takes a lot of volume, uh, but it could be, you know, it could be a, a source for producing other more suitable um, uh, fuels to be brought on board. Uh, so there is a lot of opportunity and uh, we are naturally as together with the industry exploring a lot of different pathways and then we shouldn't forget that also you know doing energy efficiency measures makes a lot of sense uh, and also to be able to have the vessels in place at the right time without you know over speeding to to meet a contractual requirement to be in a certain port at a certain uh, date and then sit outside uh, the port waiting for cargo to be loaded. So um, there, there are many things that still needs to be worked on. And I think in the overall context of digitalization and increased transparency, there are much also that we can do on increasing the efficiency uh, within the industry. But my bet would be on gas, on methanol and ammonia, and then we should continue to explore uh, a lot of the other alternatives as well. Thank you. Yeah, the next question takes us back from those future topics to the, the current situation. The question goes to Hersti, and it's uh, by Olaf Preuss from Die Welt. Uh, could you please repeat the decline in new orders for the European shipbuilding industry in 2020 compared to 2019? and the total figure of orders value for 2020? I think you were a bit fast in the beginning of the press conference. Okay, okay. I am... Um, uh, the decline of uh, decrease in tonnage is 62% uh, and 77% in value compared to 2019. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the total order book numbers here for... Uh, uh, they are... Uh, the numbers there are quite, quite fresh. I don't, and and I um I didn't bring them here, so I, think, I can't uh, answer. Olaf Olaf can get in touch with you directly uh, after yes. this press conference. Yes. Uh, th there's another question from Olaf Preuss at the Welt. Uh, goes to Martin, uh, and he also asks you to kindly repeat the decline in new order values for the global shipbuilding business in 2020 compared to 2019. Right, so I'm just having a quick look at the uh, the publication on this, and let's see what they are. Investment. Um, okay, the um, uh, just uh, sorry, I'll do a little bit of adjustment on my computer here. Um, this is um, investment by uh, region. Two thousand and nineteen was um, globally. 79.7 billion dollars and 2020 um, year-end estimate 42.4 billion dollars so there was a 47 percent decline in the value of investment uh, according to our numbers on um, Europe which I include Russia in that uh, it was 6.8 billion dollars in 2019 this is by investor, not by shipyard. This is by the the the, the, um, the, the, the company investing, and 16.4 billion dollars in 2020. So that was down 39%. Thank you. I don't know if those were, but that's it. 
Yeah. There's lots more here. <laughs> I, I bet there is, yeah. Uh, Martin, there, there's one more question to, uh, to you uh, from Port News. Uh, having studied the market of shipbuilding in Russia, which segments do you consider reasonably to focus on there? Is it reasonable to compete with Asian manufacturers of large chips? Um, well, that's an impossible question to answer. I think um, having having worked in European shipbuilding myself, I uh, it, it, it's a bit of a they're big yards out there, you know, and they've got a lot of capacity. Um, but I noticed that the um, the Russian investment was well up this, in in 2020. It was. Um, the um, your uh, Russian owners investment went up from 3.9 billion dollars to um, 6.4 billion dollars in 2020. So obviously something's going on there, and um, I, uh, I I think that in a in a situation like this, my observation or my expectation would be that everybody would look to their local owners to help them out in a tough time. I mean, we're going through this difficult period and you'll find, you know, I think you'll find each region's owners will be called upon to, to help out the shipyards to get through this difficult period. Because the one thing we know is that although this is a difficult period, believe me, if you want to have zero carbon fleet in a few years time, you've got to have the shipbuilders. You can't just let the shipbuilders disappear. So, you know, we're, we're trying to get through to the period where we've got the technology to do the job. And so I, I think my answer to that question is not just, um, you know, where are you now, but really trying to get local, good local support for the development projects uh, that you're doing, as, as Kirsty Plevin was talking about uh, in Europe, you know. Thank you. Um, as we have to come to an end now, I would like to direct a question to all our experts. We're experiencing a press conference at a distance today. Um, and over the past year, we've become more and more at ease with these formats. What are your personal expectations towards the next few days here at the fully digital SMM? Max, maybe you want to start? Yeah, first, it's great to see that such important events and, and Yes, really take place despite all the circumstances. And I think that's a very important sign, as uh, Bernd mentioned in the beginning. And it also makes the whole industry accessible to the world. It makes discussion, <laughs> discussion that is especially in these times uh, necessary. And it also allows people to participate this time, even at no cost. So that's definitely a plus. Um, personally, I must say, I really look forward to again engage in person. Networking is all about seeing each other face to face. So we will definitely have a great couple of days here in Hamburg and virtually in the next uh, four days, but uh, hopefully the next time. And again, uh, later in the year, we are all able to meet in person. I think that still makes a difference. Thank you. Andreas, what are your expectations? Well, look, um, we're all human beings. Of course, we would love to be there in person in Hamburg. We would love to kind of um, gather around, have one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, join each other at a reception in the evening, but that's not possible. But as human beings, we should not allow a pandemic to kind of take this exchange and interchange uh, away from us. And therefore, we should kind of make the best out of the digital format. Um, as Rolls-Royce Power Systems, we would have talked about our green journey boost at the SMM, and we will do this. We will do this in a different format, and we will also do this subsequent to the SMM. And therefore, I really wish all of the participants a very good connection and uh, that they make the most out of the situation and to take away as much from the SMM exchange as possible. Thank you. Shasti? Well, I'm a people person, so <laughs> I really look forward to having the possibility to meet again. But uh, uh, we may also use the advantage of, of this format. Mm -hmm. So I will, um, I will try to do some uh, drop-in uh, shopping of the, of the interesting teams in, in SMM the coming days, especially on Wednesday, when I have a bit more time free. Thank you. Knut? Thank you, Daniel. Now, I would first like to congratulate uh, 
burnt on the organizers for you know managing to convert uh, smm which is uh, such a fantastic meeting place into a fully digital four day event and I, i'm really looking forward to you know getting some uh, input getting some new digital connections and i think you know many of us are working uh, from the home office and we've been doing that for a long time and to have the possibility to really get uh, engaged uh, on this scale uh, with a well planned program i think that is uh, really you know creating uh, a really good snack for the entire week so i'm i'm very much looking forward to that thank you and martin the final one oh uh, well i um, i have to say i i'm slightly out on the wing here i've been doing 30 or 40 foreign trips a year for the last 30 years and i'm fed up with it and i think why am i trudging through terminal five again i i think that we've got a great opportunity to come up with a much to, to make this work and so i think the focus really for the next three or four uh, days is to try and proactively learn how we make this mechanism work so we don't have to get on a plane to get together. We find ways of making the digital technology work for us. And I think basically this is just another revolution for shipping. It started with the cables in 1850. That's where Clarkson's got started. And we're just moving another, and it was fantastic revolution, the cable. And I think this is another fantastic revolution so don't fight it. Let's work with it and think of the carbon you're going to save when you don't get on a plane. OK, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, too. And to wrap this up, there's a final question directed to Bernd. Uh, will the next SMM in September 2022 again take place on the exhibition grounds in Hamburg again? Well, just hearing the expectations of my most famous uh, customers, my best customers and business partners, I say yes, of course, I can't say anything else. No, um, we're assuming at this point of time that SMM uh, will again be here in Hamburg physically uh, in September 2022. And uh, I think it's definitely necessary to, to meet in, in, in person and you all just mentioned that so of course I will not disagree the uh, opposite is the fact and meeting talking uh, experiences uh, uh, each other knowledge exchange all this is, is very very important and also partying you should not we should altogether not underestimate this doing this all together and it would be quite strange if we now would all everybody would raise a glass of beer or champagne or whatever and say cheers to this uh, wonderful digital SMM. Uh, digital. <clears throat> I think these four days of SMM in two years time uh, will show again how important it is to meet physically. Um, and one thing also is very, very clear and I'm glad that Martin especially mentioned that. Um, these times we gained a lot of new experiences in the digital field and I'm absolutely sure that uh, we will embrace this and we will be able to get even more people interested joining us the SMM family, be it here in Hamburg or be it on the, at the monitors back home. And uh, this will definitely um, be the, uh, the case. And uh, I think the, this experience that we now gather will be very, very positive for the future development of the physical events like the SMM 2022. And of course, final word, I'm really, really very much looking forward to seeing you all again in person, latest at SMM in 2022. Thank you all for your thoughts. I think everybody at SMM Digital is just as excited as you are that it is finally kicking off. Thank you also to all the journalists and guests that joined us online today. If your question couldn't be answered due to our time frame, then Bianca Gellert, PR manager for SMM Hamburg, will get back to you via email individually. Also, please don't hesitate to direct further questions to her as well. And be sure to check out the SMM channels on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. I wish you a great and successful digital SMM 2021. Please stay healthy and safe. <laughs>